Good afternoon, muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos, and welcome to this second webinar in today's discussions on Lo Guadalupano, the world of Our Lady of Guadalupe and her devotees. Uh, today, as we announced this morning, is the launch event of Guadalupe at the Break of Dawn. This is a new academic project which is re-examining that very rich world. Uh, our project is organized by the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at USC uh, in conjunction with the T. Marie Chilton Chair of Catholic Theology at Loyola Marymount University, also in LA. So joining us this afternoon are Carlos Garcia Alayon, who is studying for a PhD in Biblical Studies at the University of Notre Dame, and also Jeanette Favreau-Peterson, Professor Emerita of Art History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Welcome, Jeanette, and welcome, Carlos. Uh, but before we begin our conversation, I'd like to invite our audience to participate too. Uh, you can put your questions into our guest speakers into the chat box, which is there on the side of your screen. And then later on in the session, our guest speakers will have an uh, opportunity to respond to them. Thank you. So I'm anxious to get going. Um, uh, so Jeanette, uh, you're an expert. You've written extensively about pre-Columbian art as well as colonial art in Latin America. W with Our Lady of Guadalupe, what, what's the big question that you've explored in your work? Do you want me to answer that right now or with my PowerPoint? <laughs> what are you with your PowerPoint, Jeanette? You know, we can come back to that, but feel free. Um, gosh, there's so many big questions. That's uh, a very, um, I think in, in my work, I was most interested in Guadalupe's cultural role, uh, how she managed to, in one way or another, uh, meet the needs of many constituencies in the colonial period and uh, had multiple functions, not just as a religious symbol, but as a social and political logo. Um, I think this morning we had uh, Nicole Flores talked about the fact that uh, her image calls up a mosaic of meanings and that she was able to meet people's needs on many different levels. So um, I'm primarily interested in the image and how the images work. So, so why don't you do us a, give us a show and tell on this, Jeanette? Yeah. All right. Let me just share my screen here. Bienvenidos uh, to everyone who's listening in our virtual audience. Come on. Okay. Um, one has to always begin, of course, with Guadalupe in her Basilica in Mexico City. Central to any discussion of the Virgin of Guadalupe is her original image, which was a catalyst for her devotion. 
The 16th century painting hangs in a glass enclosed case above the main altar in her Mexico City Basilica. This familiar icon is venerated by many believers. According to the legend, the image appeared on a man's cloak and thus is also referred to as the Tilma image after the Nahua name for mantle, Tilmatli. As an art historian, I'm interested in the material makeup of the Guadalupe icon. It is not just an abstraction or symbol, but is painted on cloth, has an author painter and a traceable genealogy. The Tilma image is also a cultural object that continues to perform many tasks. Not only does Guadalupe meet spiritual needs, but her image also works in the social and political spheres. Different constituencies have adopted and adapted Guadalupe to meet their agendas. Today, I want to concentrate on a close reading of three 17th century works. Among the countless reproductions of the icon, each of these marks a pivotal moment in the Guadalupe cult as it took root, matured, and spread. Firstly, I am sharing the earliest reproduction of the Tilma image that is known to exist, securely signed and dated to 1606. The artist, Baltazar de Echave Orio, scrupulously copies the exact measurements of the icon. Echave Orio also executes the painting on two strips of canvas, just as the Tilma image itself is on two vertical panels of cañamo, a European linen sewn together with cotton thread. This exactitude to detail ensured that the sacred essence of the icon was fully transferred to the replica. Echave Orio also distinguishes between two levels of reality. Notice that the image itself is luminous and seems to exist apart from the textile surface. In contrast, the heavy cloth obeys the laws of physics, falling in voluminous folds on either side of this free-floating vision. This painting then suggests a growing belief in an icon that was not made by human hands. Um, in Greek, it's an akiropoetic image. It also indicates that the number of Guadalupe devotees was growing among wealthy Creoles who are beginning to commission works of art. Let's see, I think we are By the early 17th century, there was also a need to build a new sanctuary. The second image is a copper engraving by a Flemish artist working in Mexico, whose name is Samuel Stradanus. As a fundraising tool, this flyer advertises the financial needs of the campaign, and, and that's all in the textual panel in the center of the print. Above it, we can see Guadalupe hovering in a cloud bank flanked by the oil lamps and candles on her altar. To justify collecting alms and verify the efficacy of the icon, this print also proclaims the Virgin's powers. There are eight miracle scenes along the print's side margins that describe in text and image Guadalupe's ability to touch lives by divine intervention. She could be successfully invoked in time of danger to combat dis sickness, accidents, or natural disasters. Proof is also shown in the ex votos, the tiny silver replicas of body parts that are hanging over Guadalupe's head. These were given by grateful recipients of Guadalupe's grace. Now let's just look at one of these miracle scenes, Miracle 5 in the upper right-hand corner. 
Almost every saint or Marian figure endowed with miraculous powers was credited with one incident involving a horseback riding accident. Guadalupe was no exception. Here we see the son of a wealthy hacendado, whose name was Antonio de Carvajal. And uh, in the middle image, uh, in the blow up of the miracle, you can see that the poor boy, boy's horse has bolted and his foot has gotten caught in the strip and he's being dragged along the ground. Guadalupe is invoked and saves the boy's life, a popular story that was depicted throughout the colonial period. And an oil painting of this same scene is seen in the upper right. This engraving demonstrates that the church is canonizing a cult already firmly established around a wonder-working virgin. On this screen, you can see that in the early 17th century, Guadalupe is slowly evolving. Um, Balthazar de Chaveordi in 1606 emphasized the heavy folds of the textiles. Samuel Stradanus gave us a quite robust Flemish matron as the Virgin of Guadalupe. And it's not until the middle of the 17th century that we have a standardized icon that's repeated over and over again. Now, uh, 1648 is really a turning point. Miguel Sanchez, a Creole priest, publishes an account of the image and Guadalupe's miracles. Most importantly, Sanchez records the apparitions of Guadalupe to Juan Diego. For the first time, Juan Diego is introduced as the protagonist in the apparition narrative. In the next presentation, you will hear Carlos Garcia discuss this treatise at length. He also links Guadalupe to the book of Revelation, specifically to the woman of the apocalypse in chapter 12. Uh, let's see. Okay. The Sanchez publication establishes a new iconography for Guadalupanas that includes the apparition, apparition scenes. This beautiful painting, which is my third and final image, was executed by a father and son team. And uh, they actually worked in a, in a workshop. Uh, you can see the Arellano signature and the date 1691 below the angel Cariatid uh, on the right. Um, the artwork is in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and uh, is thus accessible to those of us who live in Southern California. In the four corner medallions, the Arellanos have painted miniature versions of the poor for apocalypse scenes or uh, apparition scenes. So let's, uh, if we go to the four corners and then uh, I have blow ups on the bottom of the screen, one, two, and three, we can follow from left to right. Uh, the first apparition is to an Indian neophyte, Juan Diego, who has to trek over the hill of Tepeyac on his way to the monastery of Santiago de Tlatelolco, where he's receiving his Christian instruction. Suddenly, he hears the sweet music of birds, and in a brilliant light, a woman appears. She asks that Juan Diego go to the bishop to build a shrine for her. Juan Diego does that and is rebuffed. And so in the second apparition scene, the Virgin again appears before Juan Diego as he makes the same trip. You can see he's startled and in, in some ways he tries to uh, avoid the interception of Guadalupe. After another failure in this mission, he returns and he asks the Virgin Mary for a sign to convince the skeptical authorities. So in the lower right-hand corner, in the third apparition, you see a kneeling Juan Diego with his cloak or tilmatli, 
uh, gathering this sign, which is uh, the flowers that the Virgin Mary has appear and grow on the rocky hillside in the dead of winter. So this is a miracle in and of itself. The fourth apparition takes place in the bishop's palace. Before the astonished clerics, Juan Diego opens his cloak, spills forth the flowers, only to find the image of the Virgin Mary imprinted in their place. Guadalupe's wondrous appearance Juan Diego becomes a providential sign of her advocacy for the Mexican people with far reaching political implications. I hope that I have shown you the primacy of the Guadalupe icon and the value of close reading of the secondary images as historic documents. They record the trajectory of Guadalupe as an American Mary who could not have emerged on any other continent at any other time. Thank you. Jeanette, thank you so much. Um, you know, for a number of things, helping us to, to see differently and actually to see intelligently and to read the image as well. Um, what's wonderful is that um, you're the, the, many of the things you're saying this morning chiming with what we heard this morning from uh, Dr. Flores and Matavina. So that, uh, that you're coming at it from a different angle, um, but there's a lot of convergence as well. So. Um, let me just briefly say that for those of you who are watching at home, if you do have questions or comments for Dr. Peterson, you can type them in now in the chat box or at any point um, as we go along. Um, so, Carlos, let me bring in you here. So you're working on a PhD in Biblical Studies. Congratulations. Um, one of the questions that has been risen is the, the relationship between the devotion of millions of people to Our Lady of Guadalupe and the Bible as well. Now, I think, can you tell us a little more about the, the biblical influence uh, in Sanchez's text? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Father Dorian. Um, that really was the main question as I was delving deeper into Guadalupe, is kind of anchoring her in the wider Christian tradition and I just found when I was reading Miguel Sanchez, um, who, as Dr. Peterson said earlier, is known for authoring the first known published account of the apparition, um, just how influential scripture was for this formulation. And so I wanted to go uh, deeper. And so I think what I'll share right now is just some of my, my insights. And I, um, you'll notice that there is some really interesting resonances with what Dr. Peterson just shared. The full title of the work of Miguel Sanchez is um, Imagen de la Virgen María, Madre de Dios de Guadalupe, Milagrosamente Aparecida en la Ciudad de México, celebrada en su historia con la profecía del capítulo 12 de la Apocalipsis. It's a long title, but it really encapsulates the work that he's doing. In the work, Sanchez narrates the story of the apparitions and presents a thoroughly theological treatment of the miracle in its historical context. Sanchez's work really stands at the intersection of history, art, and theology. Oftentimes, Sanchez has recently been studied under kind of political lenses. What I aim to do is to study him under the lens of theology, and particularly um, biblical studies. Just seeing how Sanchez's work is really soaked with scripture. Every page contains references to different parts of the Bible. And Intriguingly, for, for Sanchez, Guadalupe's story doesn't really begin with the conquest or Spain um, or the Nahuas, but rather with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And I guess one of the most intriguing things about Sanchez's work, and I think why this conversation with Dr. Peterson is um, so illuminating, is that Sanchez would actually not classify himself as an, an author as much as an artist. He fundamentally sees himself as an artist retracing the image on the tilma with his words. So he writes, I have constituted myself to be a devoted painter of this holy image by writing it. And he really puts in um, his effort in describing how this is not a text. What I'm doing is retracing uh, with my pen, which is actually my paintbrush, the, the image on the tilma. Therefore, what's intriguing is that he has a very aesthetic posture, I'll just say. So with the same kind of 
depth that he encounters the Tilma, the image of Mary in the in, in Guadalupe, with that same aesthetic encounter, he turns to scripture with that exact same posture. So for Sanchez, everything begins and ends with, with an image. And so he approaches the scriptural text, searching for the images within. Um, as Dr. Peterson said earlier as well, the image on the Tilma is the, in a way, the actualization of the image of the woman in the sky described in the book of Revelation chapter 12. And this is where he anchors his spiritual exegesis is in um, Revelation 12, but he doesn't just stay there. Um, he says that the image on the Tilma is m best understood in light of the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. Um, but behind that, there's a, the whole of salvation history, the whole story of the Bible. So what I'll do briefly right now is just give a snapshot of what Guadalupe inspired biblical exegesis looks like. So I, meant, I just mentioned salvation history. So salvation history is a term often employed by theologians to describe the big picture, um, the big picture story of the Bible, how God enters human, human history in order to save it from sin and death. So I'll just um, home in on here on one of the verses that is very really influential for Sanchez, and that's Genesis 1, uh, verse 26. Um, this is, and God created humanity in his, image and, in, in his own image and likeness. What's striking about Sanchez's treatment of salvation history is that he doesn't once explicitly mention this concept of sin. If you go to any theological treatment of salvation, um, you inevitably run into the problem, which is sin. Sin is a problem for humanity. But this word doesn't appear in Sanchez's work. It's there implicitly, and I will show how, um, but he, he doesn't actually mention it. So what I'll say is that for Sanchez, it's an account, an, an aesthetic account of salvation history, um, qualified by that kind of aesthetic encounter again. So going to the verse of Genesis 1, 26, um, when God says, let us make man in our image and likeness, Sanchez really interprets this to mean that God is fundamentally an artist who paints his own image on earth. He says beautifully that God does not disdain paintbrushes to communicate himself to humanity. So he views God as a loving artist shaping and forming his creation with careful art artistic attention. So where does the problem come in? Where is the drama? The drama of human history and where humanity goes wrong is that people are drawn not to images of God, but to false and evil images. So this is how he interprets Revelation chapter 13, uh, which tells of a dragon who is the enemy of the woman, and he disperses evil images of the beast throughout the earth. So by beholding and worshiping the image of the beast, humanity tarnishes its own image and also that of the earth. So he has this um, kind of amazing reading of Genesis 3, when God casts Adam and Eve out of the garden, if you recall, when they fall and they, and they realize that they're naked, they, they take fig leaves to cover themselves. But God takes those away and instead gives them animal skins as they exit the garden. Sanchez says that this is because they couldn't take a piece of paradise with them to a fallen world. So the, the beauty of creation, in a way, stays within Eden. And now Adam and Eve also live in, in a world that is also... Um, in need of beautification. Um, so I guess fundamentally, the paradigm that Sanchez works out of in, in his treatment of salvation is this idea of beholding and becoming. As I said, humanity beholds the wrong image and becomes the wrong image, becomes a fallen image. And so they, they're estranged from God. And here he relies on St. Paul in, in his um, correspondence to the Corinthians when he says, um, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. So in beholding the right image, we become the right image and the, our original image is God. Um, he has an interesting uh, interpretation of this in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Um, so, uh, this is a good example of what he means by seeing salvation. In this chapter, uh, Saul is persecuting David because he wants to kill him, and David's hiding in a cave. It just so happens that Saul enters the cave 
to relieve himself, but doesn't realize that David's there. David has this amazing opportunity to, to kill him and to kill his persecutor, but he has mercy on Saul. And what he does instead is cut a piece of his cloth. When Saul exits the cave, David runs out after him, and there's this beautiful scene of reconciliation where Saul realizes that even though he was out to kill David, David had mercy on him and not, did not kill him. And when David holds up the cloth, um, it symbolizes salvation. In a way, Saul sees evidence for his salvation that David has spared his life. So seeing leads to conversion and reconciliation. And, and this is how Sanchez interprets this chapter in light of his experience of Guadalupe. So the question before humanity at the end of the day is, which image will you behold, gods or the dragons? So the question is, where do we find God's image? For Sanchez, every Christian is an image of God, as, as we read in Genesis chapter 126. And um, one of his beautiful, I guess, spiritual insights is that when he says, when you get tempted, when you approach uh, an, a false image, just say, I am an image of God as a way to... Uh, defend yourself. But this isn't enough because our image, as, as I've said, is has been tarnished. And so God gives us an image, uh, um, his most perfect image, which is Mary. Um, therefore, this is derived from tradition where the most perfect creation or creature is, um, is Mary. And so in a way, in beholding Mary, we have access to the artist who is the creator of the universe through his perfect um, craft, craftsmanship in Mary. So he has this idea even that beholding images of Mary will shatter images of the beast. And this is where Juan Diego comes in and becomes critical. And he really um, goes to Isaiah chapter 61 and places this chapter, which is full of redemption, into the voice, into the mouth of um, Juan Diego. So I'll just read it briefly. Uh, and just picture Juan Diego saying this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Oh, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. For as the earth bring forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. So Sanchez understands Juan Diego in his encounter with Mary to be transfigured with this encounter, beholding, becoming. What Juan Diego be beholds, he becomes. So Juan Diego becomes a prophet that also fulfills Isaiah 61. And he describes, Sanchez describes Juan Diego as one dressed with the sky and beautified with lucid rays. So there's this beautiful transfiguration of Juan Diego so he actually becomes a prophet of beauty. And hom just homing in on the last metaphor of, of the, the passage I just read, salvation also includes the beautification of the earth. God is an artist also in a horticultural sense. So he quotes Isaiah 65, the desert shall rejoice and block blossom. Juan Diego brings the roses from the new paradise with, with which the new garden of salvation is already being planted. So if you recall, Adam and Eve could not bring out the fig leaves from Eden, but Juan Diego can bring out the roses from his encounter with Guadalupe. And in that, in that way, ushers, helps usher in the um, redemption of, of the world. So just to wrap it up, Sanchez ends his work by meditating on the words uh, of Christ on the cross in the Gospel of John, the central act of redemption in human history. And he focuses in on when Jesus turns to the beloved disciple and tells him, behold your mother. And he really takes this at, at face value. He says, when Jesus says, behold your mother, he's telling you to behold your mother. And this is what, uh, for Sanchez, we can do before the image of, of Guadalupe is behold um, his mother. And I'll just quote uh, very briefly the ending of his work, which I think uh, gives a good taste of um, what he's all about. So he, he ends it by, by saying, Behold your mother, behold her image of Guadalupe. Here you behold the protectress of the poor. Here you behold the counsel of Christian living. Here you behold the fragrance of her miracle. Here you behold the medicine to the sick. Here you behold the comfort of the afflicted. 
Here you behold the intercessor of the troubled. Here you behold the honor of Mexico City. Here you behold the glory of all those faithful dwellers of the new world. Wow. Well, um, Carlos, um, I think you have a book there. Um, this is great. Thank you so much for giving us a glimpse into this. What is clearly uh, a really, really rich text. Um, for those of you who are uh, watching at home, can I just say that if you have questions or comments uh, of uh, things that Carlos has shared with us, uh, you can type them in, uh, in at any point. Um, so Jeanette and Carlos, one of the things we're doing with this project is getting people from different kinds of backgrounds and uh, different academic specialities to talk to each other, you know? Um, so we have images, Jeanette, that show what the texts talk about. Uh, and then Carlos, we have words that do a really deep interpretation of the image. So we have seeing and we have reading, two different ways of understanding. And then we have two experts in front of us um, each of you who have your own skill sets uh, and their own tools of the trade. Um, so let me ask you for each other, what questions and comments do you have for one another as a art historian and as a biblical scholar? I think the question of the relationship between text and image is a, is a very important one. And both are useful in the uh, Guadalupe devotion. Um, we talk about seeing texts and reading images, which almost seems uh, like the reverse of what we should say, but images can be read just as texts can. And um, the relationship, I think, is complementary, not oppositional. And by, by reading an image, I mean really uh, closely examining and analyzing it uh, and deriving from it a body of knowledge or data just as uh, text does. There are differences in the methodology in that text is quite linear. Uh, in the syntax of a language, you move from one sign to the next, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Whereas images are a little more free form and evocative, I would say. Uh, they promote a variety of interpretations. And I'm not saying that text doesn't also, but I think an image in particular um, is filtered in the way you see it and you bring all of your cultural assumptions uh, to the way we see. And this is especially true in a sacred image, uh, depending so much on your own religious affiliation, on all of the cultural values that you've been brought up with as to whether you quote, see, um, the sacredness of the image or take it as a devotional object or whether what you see is simply a beautiful work of art or a sculpted uh, uh, idol or icon or image of some kind. So uh, there are a lot of parallels, but they are, and they are complementary, but I think they're also slightly different. Yeah, uh, I think just, just building off of that, um, one of the things that when you mentioned reading an image that it, that definitely caught my attention because um, that's not typically how i guess in popular culture we, we would think about it um, but i think what how you led us through the images really showed us what that looks like um, and one of the things that struck me was in your discussion of echave orio's orio's image uh, about how the cloth was obeying the the laws of physics but the image seemed to be hovering above it and I, I resonated a lot with that in my um, work with Sanchez because I think that's in a way how he would describe scripture itself or how he approaches it, where you have the cloth, which is kind of the, the pages of the Bible or, or the biblical text. And these are generating um, aesthetic objects, let's say, that kind of hover above the page, which the reader can then come to encounter these aesthetic objects. Um, I'm drawing on um, recently a... Um, Biblical scholar Antonio Portolatin has um, written a little bit about what it means to encounter scripture uh, aesthetically. And, and this is what he does. He says that when we read, we construct aesthetic objects upon which we encounter kind of something supernatural. So um, again, I, I think just coming at it from, from the text side and then kind of meeting in the middle, I think it's uh, just fascinating how, um, how many resonances there are between what we do. 
I have a question for you, Carlos. Um, I was really intrigued how you highlighted and foregrounded the, the biblical passages. Why do you think Sanchez peppered his account with so many biblical illusions? What do you think motivated him to do that? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think I would say maybe two reasons. The first uh, is that he probably stands in a long line of Catholic tradition where um, scripture is just interweaved. So um, the church fathers in a lot of their writings also have similar interweavings of, of scripture. Um, I think that, um, so I think that's the first reason, but I think secondly is that for Sanchez, scripture is not just kind of a, a document of the past, but it, it's a document, it, it's a living, it's a living thing that the word of God for him is alive. And so when he encounters this incredible, incredibly mysterious image in the, in the Tillman and he's moved with so much beauty, he turns to the, the thing or the resource that, that he finds as, I guess, the, the, the closest thing he can use to ex express reality or to really understand what's going on. And, and that's scripture. And, and I think that's how he beautifully kind of anchors Guadalupe within his theological worldview and, and, and kind of shows how scripture doesn't just say things in the past, but it's actually alive and happening right here, right now. Um, history is in a way the fulfillment of and the enactment of the biblical text as it, as it lives. I, I have a couple more reasons that I've <laughs> thought of. Um, I think it's part of the literary style of the 17th century also to be, because in many places he's rather Baroque and florid and uh, you could almost say convoluted in his writing style. And it reminds me of Sienza y Gongora, who was a famous 17th century poet in Mexico City. Um, the other thing I've thought about Miguel Sanchez he was an incredibly bold pioneering figure if we're talking about Guadalupe's devotion. Imagine being the first to publish an account, to have it out there in public. He was taking a risk, if you will, and these biblical passages reinforced what, what he was saying. They sort of anchored it in, as you mention this long theological tradition. Um, and it probably also enabled him to establish his own credentials as someone worthy of being the first chronicler of, of Guadalupe's miracles and apparition scene. So there, there are many reasons, but um, it, he's very attuned to the aesthetics of the experience. He's a poet in many ways, um, not just a theologian, so. I, I think that's very striking, Jeanette, in, as you talk about poetry, um, because we talked a lot about theology today, and Carlos, you you say that that uh, Miguel Sanchez describes himself as a kind of another painter in some ways, so he's, it's almost as like he's uh, elaborating on the, with his words, he's painting a picture of the picture, uh, as it were. Um, both of you mentioned in your presentations, and there's just a little point of clarification that, that Sanchez's social class, he's a criollo, right? He's, he's, he is, um, from Spanish descent, he's not indigenous uh, uh, descent, so he's from that particular social class. Um, how do you think that class thing affects both um, uh, what Sanchez is writing about, but who these, you mentioned this new class that is now able to afford um, to commission new paintings, Jeanette. If you could talk a little bit, I think it'd be interesting to explore uh, who, who, is the, who are the devotees at this point, at an early point? Uh, let me turn again to the Strada News uh, copper engraving. The eight yeah. miracle scenes on the sides of the print, uh, we went into one of them. Seven of them benefit uh, the elite, essentially. These are wealthy from the little scenes on the side. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the figures, we can't see them here because they're too small, but uh, many of them, let's see, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a well-dressed, 
Spaniard with his hat on and so forth, uh, who is uh, in this particular miracle um, thanking Guadalupe because she has healed his headaches. And um, only one of the eight miracles involves an indigenous Indian, Juan Pavon, who was sacristan of the um, uh, shrine of Guadalupe. So uh, this tells us, of course, the, the print was made as a flyer to raise money. And obviously you're gonna go to the people who have the money in order to get donations. So this is a little bit skewed, uh, but nonetheless, I think uh, what we have here is an initial um, growth in among the Creole class to have an American Virgin Mary, someone they could claim as their own. And in particular, they were combating the virgin most associated with the Gachupinas or the peninsular Spaniards, who was the uh, virgin de los Remedios. So uh, Guadalupe and Remedios represent two different um, classes in colonial Mexico. Which is a fascinating insight because you've got, this morning we talked about the connection between the Mary of Nazareth of the Bible and then Guadalupe. You know what, here we have, I guess, two different representations of Mary who are almost uh, embattled with each other uh, way. So, um, um, in terms I, of, you know, real, real quick. Yeah. Please, I, yeah. oh, no, absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess, like, ahead. one thing I I, I would say, as as Dr. Pearson was talking as well, is that um, one of the problematic things about Sanchez is that he really kind of represents a Eurocentric uh, view mm. of colonial, colonialization, and and that's problematic. And I think that um, must be addressed for him. Um, so uh, the conquest was part of salvation history. So in a way, he was very much a, a man of, of of his time. But there are moments where that kind of gives way to much deeper spiritual um, insights. So some of the criticism of the earlier treatments of Guadalupe is that not much attention is given to Juan Diego. And what Dr. Marovina uh, mentioned earlier as well in, in the webinar is that if you love Guadalupe, you have to love Juan Diego, whom she loves. Um, and so one of the beautiful, most striking things in, in, in Sanchez is his, the treatment of uh, Isaiah that I kind of mentioned, how uh, I, uh, Juan Diego assumes the voice of Isaiah the prophet which is a text usually used by the Gospels to, to represent Jesus and, and, and his own work. So it's this kind of amazing elevation of Juan Diego that often goes un, unnoticed. And I think despite the fact that in many, in many ways his text is a uh, product of, um, of his time, there are those beautiful kind of breakthroughs that, that signal um, where the Guadalupe devotion will kind of expand and, and grow. Thank you. And I, mean, yeah. I think you mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, now, Jeanette, please go jump in. I, I was just going to mention also that I think the indigenous voice is silenced uh, because they didn't have access to the uh, publications and uh, they couldn't afford the kinds of paintings, for example, that we have documenting uh, the miracle of, of Antonio de Carvajal. What did, um, and perhaps we'll never have proof of this, but um, I think what persisted in that period when we don't have any documentation uh, were songs and oral traditions that certainly may have kept alive the uh, Native American participation in the devotion to Guadalupe. Um, so that it partially explains why Juan Diego seems to appear so late in the devotion. Thank you. Well, that actually, that kind of brings us really into a question, because as we've been, um, as you've been talking, um, we've been joined by the audience, have been posting their own questions and comments. So uh, um, one of those is actually, um, uh, is actually about precisely about that, uh, that you just mentioned. But let me go in for a question, first of all. Uh, this is a question for you, Carlos. Um, and the question is this, how can we properly behold Our Lady of Guadalupe, not as an end, but as a means to an end, remembering that she ultimately points us to Christ and to salvation. That is a fantastic, fantastic question. Um, I think first and foremost, what Sanchez kind of teaches us is that in order to really understand or really be able to behold Guadalupe in the right way, 
we have to know scripture. So when you approach mm-hmm. Guadalupe, you have to come with, with the Bible, with scripture. And it is constant referencing back to the image, back to, back to the Bible, back to the image, back to the Bible. And that's going to inform and, and help see kind of the, the mystery and, and, and take it back to, um, to God and the end. And that's one of the amazing things when I visited the Basilica um, in Mexico City was just the amount of masses that were being said. And so you have the image in the background, but at the same time, you know, at the mass, we, we read the Gospels, we, we, read, the whole, we read the Bible, um, Old Testament, New Testament. And so there's this interplay of scripture and beholding in the experience of the Basilica. So if you want to be, I guess what Sanchez would say, if you want to behold in the right way, um, read scripture. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a good, it's a good question because uh, I think uh, Dr. Flores this morning was very much talking about reading, uh, reading Guadalupe, particularly reading Juan Diego, I think uh, through the lens of the Magnificat, for, for example. Um, Jeanette, is there a question here for you? Uh, right at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned, if I, if I remember correctly, that you meant the Guadalupe icon is painted on cloth and it has a discernible um, um, painter author, uh, which would, would there, we can testify to. Could you tell us a little more about you know, that, uh, that, uh, what you said there? Uh, yes, obviously, this is controversial. I'll just begin with that. But um, I'm taking a lot of my information from a conservator named uh, Jose Sol Rosales, who worked in the 1980s and uh, whose work was published in 2002 after the canonization of Juan Diego. And um, he, he's a conservator and a very well respected one. His analysis, interestingly enough, fit very closely with Miguel Cabrera's 18th century treatise on the image itself. Miguel Cabrera was a well-known painter. Um, He came up with all of the right pigments that were used and the cloth that was used. But in the end, uh, as a good Guadalupano, he said it was miraculously imprinted. Um, But we know what the There were four types of tempera paint, for example. Uh, We have a very good idea of what the cloth was and the way it's sewn up the center. It has endured over the years um, a great deal of damage. Um, Then, in fact, by the 17th century, they were already putting it under a double pane of glass to protect it. So um, it it, it was a product of human craft. Uh, and the artist was a certain Marcos who worked in uh, probably 1555, 56, uh, Marcos Sipac de Aquino, or there's another shadowy Marcos, Marcos Griego, who has also been cited as a possible painter. And uh, we know that Alonso de Montufar was the uh, commissioned the work. He was uh, the bishop after Juan de Sumarga. Yeah, thank you. So then there's a question is, uh, so if the good Guadalupano says this is a miraculous me- me- uh, image, then the question is, what do we mean by that, right? You know, and because um, we have here the, uh, the conservator is saying one thing, and then the text is saying something, Sanchez is saying something else, Carlos. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Um, I think... Um, but- I'm not an art historian, so I, I don't know much about um, kind of the, the art around that time. But I guess what what I'll say is that, um, yeah, for, for Sanchez, everything stands on the fact that this is an image given from, from, from heaven. And that's how he fundamentally understands it. And that's how he um, writes his theology. As he says, the fact that Guadalupe is so powerful, and I, I think we can attest to kind of her power through history, is because it was an image that was handed from from heaven. And so a lot of the spiritual renewal, a lot of the spiritual insights that people have and, and encounters when they go to the Basilica and a lot of the testimonies is because there is something um, about beholding the artist through mm-hmm. um, Mary and the artist is fundamentally God. Um, and so that, that's the source of spiritual renewal. 
If, if I can put on my theologian's Beretta here, you know, I think one of the things we might think about is the scripture is uh, both, uh, is written by human authors. Uh, the, I guess the ultimate author is God, you know, so it's divinely inspired. So, I mean, I think it perhaps it might, uh, one of the things to think about is actually what do we mean by a miraculous image and in which way is it miraculous? I mean, um, Carlos, what, one of our, our questions is here has some, one of our audience has a question for you. Um, for Sanchez, uh, she says or he, uh, that salvation includes beautification. I think that's what you said. Uh, can you tell us more about how Miguel Sanchez understands the relation between between salvation and beauty? Because we Ooh, tend to think about salvation and goodness, right, rather than run uh, than be, than beauty. Yep, absolutely. Um... That's really kind of the, the big question that um, is permeates throughout Sanchez's whole work. And I guess um, for him, the reason why there is why, why there is such power in Guadalupe is because of the power of, of beauty. And I think I'll, I'll take it back to what uh, his description of Juan Diego, which is really moving. Um, I, I don't have the exact quote here, but if you read, what happens when San, when Juan Diego encounters the Virgin of, of Guadalupe is this transfiguration, and he, he goes into this beautiful language of um, in beholding Juan Diego all of a sudden becomes transfigured with with light, um, and in a sense, like I said, becomes a prophet of of beauty. And I think one of the mm -hmm. the, the amazing things is that when we think about sin, we typically think about sin in Kind of a very kind of theologically heady sense but we don't really think about it in, in its ugly sense like sin is ugly at the end of the day in uh, in uh in, in christian experience um there's an ugliness ugliness that comes with with sin and i think the great thing is that, that when you recognize kind of that ugliness and also the beauty of goodness um mm -hmm. then you you yourself start becoming more and more beautiful not just uh, on the outside, but but also on, on the inside. So, yeah. So I'm reminded in many ways when I read Sanchez of just of Eastern theology, the Orthodox theology. Uh, I mean, the famous phrase everybody quotes is from Dostoevsky, which is that uh, that beauty will save the world, uh, and it's beauty not as in a beautiful face, uh, but it's the beauty of God which is there. Jeanette, I interrupted you there. I'm sorry. Well, I think this. Um the aesthetics of apparitions in general, if you look back uh, to Europe and the long, long tradition of the encounters with the holy in Europe um, and many, many Marian apparitions, you're struck by uh, the fact that all the senses are um, exaggerated in these encounters. So in all of them, there's music, um, there is uh, a sweet smell uh, that they describe uh, with flowers, of course. And uh, then there's this brilliant light. So mm -hmm. your everything, but really your mind is being um, encouraged to accept this vision that is otherwise uh, not part of your daily reality. And um, I think it's this aesthetic that uh, Sanchez is really focusing on. I, I want to make an interesting point about the Guadalupe story, and in particular about Sanchez, and that is the role of flowers. Um, in, in Europe and in Spain in particular, it was usually uh, roses. And in Sanchez's account, he talks about lilies, violets, um, mm -hmm. carnations, and roses. So it's flowers as a whole that um, are gathered in Juan Diego's Tinatli. So, um, and the point I want to uh, really get to in, in this discussion about uh, a, an Orthodox European tradition as opposed to a Nahua indigenous tradition is that uh, flowers were a very important part of the sacred world. Uh, for peoples living in Mexico prior to the conquest. So the Nahua sacred was called the flowery world and uh, flowers conjured up what for them was paradise. 
uh, a land of fecundity, of rejuvenation, of new beginnings. So in, in this way, we have the two traditions coming together in a very, I think, powerful way that flowers played an important role in, in both cultures' sense of what was considered to be the sacred. Um, and, and Sanchez played on that, I'm sure. He wasn't so European that he wasn't aware of what the native traditions were. I, I think he was born, correct me if I'm wrong, Carlos, in uh, Tlaxcala, is that correct? Or Puebla? Puebla was he? I don't recall right now. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. in any event, he, uh, that, that's just a, we'll just have to conjure that, <laughs> imagine yeah. that, I think. I, but I think you're you're completely right about the, the flowers, Dr. Pearson, because at, at one point um, he says that it's not just beholding the image, but the image itself gives the perfume of, of, of roses. And that scent in and of itself is able to drive away the demons and is able to drive away the evil spirits, just the smell of, of roses. Um, and I think in a sense, it's a fully aesthetic encounter and within tradition, the Catholic tradition may have this idea of the odor of holiness. Um, there's yeah. saints with that, that smell of roses. Um, so holiness, it's beauty in an olfactory sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is very rich because in our uh, Western tradition, I don't think, I mean, we, we talk about the smell of holiness in our Catholic and Orthodox ceremonies. We use it, we, we use incense, but I, uh, we're pretty heady, I think, in many ways. Um, one thing we will be, you're already pointing forward to what we're going to be talking about uh, just in a couple of hours. Um, in terms of popular devotion, um, both of you will know the fl phrase flor y canto, um, you know, the kind of this sort of aesthetic spiritual world, uh, I think, of, of uh, Latinx Catholicism, uh, which clearly, as you say, Je Jeanette has Nawa and also has European re roots as well. But the fact that there it's already prefigured in the uh, Sanchez story uh, with the birds singing, you've got music going on, you've got the flowers uh, uh, going on, uh, on there at the same time as signals, I guess, of the, the divine being present uh, in this world. Um, w one last question here, and it's really a sort of a nuts and bolts practical question. Um, so we have um, the image, and then we have the oral history, uh, and then we have the 1648 uh, uh, image there, the 1648 volume of Sanchez. Is there an oral history that connects the two? The um this is debated, um, Dorian. Uh, Lasso de la Vega, Luis Lasso de la Vega, who wrote the uh, next chronicle in, in the year following Sanchez in 1649, uh, has the apparition story in Nahuatl. It's called the Nikan Mopoa. And he claimed that um, Sanchez uh, made it very clear that he could not find any documents. He, he looked and looked, but he could not substantiate his account on anything that was written. Lazo de la Vega, on the other hand, made sort of vague allusions to something that existed, some source, although he was never very specific. Um, you know, with the Strada Nus engraving, my sense is that there was a tradition that perhaps started as early as the late 16th century um, that may have been written and no longer exists. That's certainly one possibility. The, the Nahua itself has been analyzed by Nahuatlatos and there's a divergence of interpretations. Some claim that it's very classical Nahuatl, that it could have been written in the early, late 16th century. Others said no, James Lockhart, for example, that it's 17th and 18th century Nahuatl. So I think it's that's a question that's very much up in the air. Yeah, and I think if I could just um, kind of add to that, I think Dr. Timothy Marovina, who spoke earlier, I think has a, a really balanced take on this question because he says, there's a tendency to go to one extreme or the other to say that uh, if it happened, like the uh, like the the story says, and you must have written evidence, an explosion of devotion, and 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 you don't you don't have that in the documents, and so it's it doesn't come till later. But then and then the other extreme is to say, oh, it, it's um, it's an invention of Miguel Sanchez that he just kind of like put things together. But I think 
uh, Dr. Maravina has a good um, kind of balanced position in which he says, no, I think the devotion was decidedly local. It was a local devotion. And because it was primarily indigenous, a lot of the upper classes didn't really pay much attention uh, to it uh, until it, it started to gain more and more power. And so uh, it makes sense that um, there might not be official documents that say a lot about the, um, the devotion until um, uh, decades later, but it was a, a local tradition. And Sanchez does emphasize that he did, he did look for documents and he couldn't find it, but then he went around and asked people for their testimonies. And he, he doesn't say exactly who, but he says he asked and asked and asked until the point where, where he was able to form the big story. So he, he says that he, his account is primarily reliant on the oral tradition of, um, of the elders and, and, and of the people that he interviewed. Um, I, I also know there was a big fire in the cathedral that, that burnt, I think, a lot of documents. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think Sanchez says that he couldn't find the, the documents. But So that leaves us with um, a lot of unknowns here and more to, more to discover. I think the, uh, what is the phrase that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, you know? So um, uh, it's important to, uh, and I think to understand that, you know, our Western ways, we're very literary based. We like, we hard in fact evidence. We must remember that we are talking about very different cultures and things. Um, folks, I, we're almost time to wrap up, but I, I do want to ask you both uh, a, a personal question. I, I hope I'm not going to put you too much on the spot with this. Um, so uh, I'll ask the question and then whoever wants can jump in first. And it's just, a, I'm just asking for, uh, for myself and also for a few. It's a very simple question. What does Nuestra Señora Guadalupe mean to you personally? Um, <clears throat> I, I have to answer that by saying that I have known wonderful people in my life who were Guadalupanas, including uh, my mother was born and raised in Mexico, and she was raised by a woman named Lupita. We called her Lupe. And she lived to be 102. And uh, she, for me, was sort of a living embodiment of Guadalupe, or everything Guadalupe stands for. So um, uh, that's an indirect way of answering. Uh, but I am impressed with how critical how pivotal she is in people's lives and how she gives them hope hope for a better existence and um, that, that's, that's a very beautiful it's a great answer thank you Jeanette thank you for that and Carlos um, there's nobody else to answer so I think it must be you the yeah uh, it's a great question Father Dorian I think we tend to sometimes think about an encounter with a divine in very in a very heady theological sense as, as you said it and as an academic myself in the PhD program, that's what I tend to do. And one of the beautiful things about Guadalupe is that um, it's in a way God breaking through and speaking through through beauty. And it's an encounter with the divine that goes straight to, to our, what we yearn the most. I think we're surrounded with so much ugliness uh, in the world and, and so much strife. Um, that the beauty drives us to, to God. And I, I just go back to the words that, um, Mary says to Juan Diego in the Nican Mapujua is, Hijo predilecto de mi amor, que nada turba tu corazón, acaso no estoy aquí, yo que soy tu madre. Um, and it just, uh, it just speaks to the heart. Um, and I think that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, well, thank you for uh, for your contributions because you've led us to the heart and to the head as well, and both are necessary, I think. So, there. So, thank you for that. So, uh, Jeanette and Carlos, um, you know, uh, I'm going to give you a sort of round of applause here for myself. Uh, but thank you. We're so grateful to you for joining with us today and sharing your knowledge and your insights. Um, I've learned a lot today, and I'm hoping that um, you've learned from each other and our audience too at home has also learned as well. So thank you, audience, for tuning in, and thank you for your questions and comments. Um, our daily, our seminar series, our webinar series, continues in just two hours' time at 5 o'clock Pacific. Um, at that point, we will be joined by theologian and author Professor Wendy Wright, and also by composer and Grammy-nominated musician Pedro Rubalcaba, and they're going to discuss the world of popular devotion and the rich legacy of Guadalupe, uh, Guadalupe music. So please do join us. Esperamos que nos veamos luego a las cinco, ¿no?
Uh, but if you cannot join us, all of our webinars today will soon be available on the website, which is www.iacs.usc.edu. Uh, so finally, once again, Jeanette and Carlos, many, many thanks for helping us all think deeper about this endlessly fascinating world of Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. Gracias y que les vaya bien. Thank you. Thank you.